Good morning. My name is Anna Proctor and I'm a sixth grade English teacher at Bouchard Middle School. So over the last few days we've been talking about making inferences and we've had some practice with both fiction and nonfiction texts. So today we're going to look at another nonfiction article and then for practice you're going to have a fiction text as well to work on. Um, fiction I mean, nonfiction and fiction is what you are going to have. So first, let's try to remember, what does it mean to make an inference? So I want you to pause this video and think about the two things that you need in order to make an inference. What are the two things you need? Okay, now that you have paused the video, we're going to go back to the definition of making an inference and the two different things that you need to make an inference, looking at the video from yesterday or from the beginning of the week. An inference is an educated guess we make from evidence in front of us while accessing prior knowledge. So it's an educated guess. Basically, that means we're trying to read between the lines, make a guess about what the author is saying that we make from using text evidence, which are clues from the text that's in the text or in front of us while accessing or thinking of using Accessing is using our prior knowledge or what we already know about the subject or topic. So then always remember that making an inference requires both your prior knowledge or background knowledge plus your text evidence. Another word for text evidence is or another word for text evidence is a clue. So text evidence, clues from the text. Our text evidence. Okay, so your prior knowledge, also known as your background knowledge, plus your text evidence, one or more pieces of evidence or proof that help um, that helps to support your inference equals making an inference or making an educated guess to try to figure out what the author is saying. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a new article today. The article is called A Museum of Their Own. You have a link to this article. If you can pause this video and go to that article, that will help. This is a nonfiction article, so pause for a second. Click on the link to the readworks.org article. Now that you've done that, please go to the vocabulary. <clears throat> so read along silently while I read aloud. Obscurity, obscurity. It is a noun, which is a person, place, or thing. The first definition is the state or condition of being dark or dim. The example sentence is, it was impossible to make out the man's face in the obscurity of the cellar. The second definition is the state or condition of being unknown. As an artist, he was rescued from obscurity when one of his works turned up in a famous collection. The third one, that which is obscure. The Spanish cognate or similar word is obscuridad. The Spanish word obscuridad means obscurity. There are some, these are some examples of how the word or forms of the word are used. One, they had always called it the Forgotten Island because no one but them seemed to remember its existence. It wasn't on any of the maps they could find, and the park rangers didn't know about it. But its obscurity didn't bother the island. It just kept on existing. Lena secretly loved that the island was a secret between the three of them, her, Caesar, and Marie. Two. The new research center at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum will give the public a chance to learn more about those players and hundreds of others who toiled in the baseball, who toiled in baseball obscurity. So now I would like you to click on passage. You can either choose to print out this passage um, and then do what I'm asking you to do, or you can read along with me electronically. Okay. So this is called a museum of their own. This is a nonfiction factual article with facts in it that can be proven. It is not made up. It is a really interesting article. So I think you will really like this one. Um, it's about some real baseball players and about um, a museum of their own. So we're going to, we don't really exactly know what it's about yet. So I want you to think about the title and we're going to make a prediction. So what I tell my students to do is underline the title and then think about a guess based on the title about what the article is going to be about or what the text is going to be about. So in this case, I think there's a picture of a baseball player, it's an African American baseball player. He's smiling, seems happy. The title is a museum of their own. It might be about a museum for African American baseball players. We don't really know though. We have to read the article to find out. So we read the article to see if our prediction is correct. So the next thing I have my students do is they look at the picture and the caption, the words underneath the picture. 
picture is uh, here with a baseball player and then another person here. Willie Mays and Roy Campanella started out in the Negro Leagues and followed Jackie Robinson into the majors. Okay, so we're going to find out more about them in the in this article. So the next thing I want you to do, if you have printed out the article, you can number the paragraphs or you can keep mental track of the paragraphs as you're looking at it electronically. This is paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, paragraph four, paragraph five, paragraph six, paragraph seven, paragraph eight, paragraph nine, paragraph 10, paragraph 11, paragraph 12, paragraph 13, paragraph 14, <clears throat> paragraph 15, paragraph 16, paragraph 17, paragraph 18. So this is a bit of a longer text. So this article is also divided into subheadings. At the very beginning, we have the first several paragraphs are in an introductory section. Then we have a subheading, which is like a mini title, which tells us about what the next few paragraphs underneath it will be about. This one is titled First Negro League. That's our subheading. The next one is great ball players. And here's another picture from the Library of Congress. Jackie Robinson integrated baseball by playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. We're going to find out more about that. Integrating means to uh, make sure that it's not segregated, which is divided by race. The next section is going to be about unique history. So what we're going to do now that we've made a prediction and numbered our paragraphs, we are going to, and looked at our pictures, we are going to read through each paragraph, think about what we're reading. You can write down notes about what you're reading or your thoughts, which are called annotations, as you read, if you would like. After that, we will look at the questions, um, the inference question set specifically, and we will answer two questions together um, as guided practice, and then you will have to answer the rest of the questions on your own. We also have some practice that you can complete tonight for making inferences. Please read along silently as I read aloud. When the baseball that Leroy Satchel Page and Josh Gibson autographed went up for sale several years ago, the staff at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum wanted to get their mitts on it. And why wouldn't they? On the ball were the signatures of two of the greatest players in Negro Leagues history, in all of baseball history for that matter. But the small museum devoted to telling the story of the Negro Leagues struck out. The round relic fetched $30,000, more than the museum's yearly budget to buy, to buy such items. Now, though, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is about to hit a home run. Officials have unveiled an ambitious $15 million project to expand the organization's collection and exhibition space. Exhibition space. The museum plans to buy an old building up the street from the current museum and to turn it into a library and research center. The vacant building is an old YMCA where the first Negro League was born. The building served the black community of Kansas City, Missouri for decades. It was a place where people could go and get something to eat and not worry about segregation, Ray Doswell, the museum's curator, told Weekly Reader Senior Citizen. It's also where the Negro National League was founded. Isn't that interesting? So we're going to go to our first subheaded section now that we've read the introduction. First Negro League. Why did African Americans need a league of their own? They had to form their own leagues because they weren't allowed to play with white ball players, and that was unfair, obviously. The first Negro League got its start in 1920. That's when Andrew Rube Foster, a pitcher in the a pitcher with the 1902 Cuban X Giants and the Chicago Union Giants, decided that black players needed a baseball league. Foster met with a group of African Americans at the YMCA in Kansas City. There, they formed the Negro National League. The league flourished which means they succeeded for a decade. It is your league, Foster told fellow African-Americans. Nurse it, help it, keep it. African-Americans soon began playing in other Negro leagues around the country. Traveling from town to town was a hard life for many. Because hotels in many cities did not allow blacks inside, the players slept on buses and stadiums and along the sides of roads. More often than not, I'm going to scroll down here. More often than not, the players had to face ethnic slurs and taunts. Out on the field, there'd be some white folks in the stands, Satchel Page wrote in his autobiography. Some of them would call you hateful names, but most would cheer you. In 1947, black players finally got their shot in the majors. That's when Jackie Robinson, a veteran of the Negro Leagues, integrated baseball while playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. 
Isn't that amazing? So let's reread that paragraph again, because that seems to be very important. In 1947, black players finally got their shot in the majors. That's when Jackie Robinson, a veteran of the Negro Leagues, a veteran of the Negro Leagues, integrated baseball while playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So he was the first black player to play um, on a baseball team that was not a base, black baseball team. He helped integrate baseball ball while making it an all races and all ethnicities game in the United States, which is awesome. Great ball players this is our next section. Many Negro League players became baseball's best. Henry Aaron, who played for several major league teams, including the Atlanta Braves, began his career slugging home runs for the Indianapolis Clowns of the of the Indianapolis Clowns of the Negro American League. In 1974, he broke Babe Ruth's all-time home run mark. That's amazing because Babe Ruth was such a great um, baseball player. He's a legend. James Cool Papa Bell was one of the fastest men in baseball. During his career, he stole 173 bases. Page used to sell, Page used to say Bell was so quick that he could flip off a light switch in the bedroom and be across the room under the covers before the light went out. Then there was Page himself. After two decades in the Negro Leagues, Page helped the Cleveland Indians with win the American League pennant in 1948. At the time, Page was a 42-year-old Major League rookie pitcher. So he was actually a, a new pitcher, even though he's 42 years old. It's amazing. He broke that record. Unique history. The new research center at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum will give the public a chance to learn more about those players and hundreds of others who toiled in the baseball and baseball obscurity. There will be interactive exhibits and computers as well as memorabilia. The museum is already home to dozens of bats, balls, and uniforms, and hundreds of photographs. There's a connection between baseball and African American history, Dazwell told Weekly Reader Senior Edition. We want to show young people what these guys went through just to play baseball. Many of these guys worked in the iron mills on, or on railroads until game time. Isn't that amazing? So we're going to now look at the questions. Go to click on question sets. The museum, and we're going to inference questions. The museum staff is probably excited about its new building because a, it will have room to display the autographed baseball. B, it got 15 million to buy the building. C, it is the exact building where Negro Leagues began. D, the vacant building was once a YMCA. So in order to find the answer, we need to look for our text evidence. So we need to make an inference, and in order to do that, we need to use both our background knowledge, also known as our prior knowledge, plus our clues from the text, also known as text evidence. You need at least one piece of text evidence to make an inference. So we're going to go back to the passage, and we're going to try to figure out why the museum staff is ex probably excited about its new building. So we're going to look for the museum staff talking about its new building. We're going to do something called skimming, which means not rereading the entire text, but looking through the text and looking for the items that uh, the section that we need. And then we can reread that part. You do actually need to reread the text in, in entirety, the whole thing, more than once in order to fully understand it. You never just read a text one time and fully understand it. You must reread again and again until you understand it. Um, and to find the answers to the questions, of course. So here we go. Let's go as we're looking through this. As we're skimming, going through the paragraphs. So let's look at this. Let's talk about the new museum. The museum plans to buy an old building up the street from the current museum to turn it into a library and research center. The vacant building is an old YMCA where the first Negro League was born. The building served the black community of Kansas City, Missouri for decades. It was a place where people could go and get something to eat and not worry about segregation, Ray Doswell, the museum's curator, told Weekly Reader um, Senior Edition. It's also where the Negro, Negro National League was founded. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the questions, see if we can slash some trash and pick our best answer <clears throat> using that text evidence plus our background knowledge. The museum staff is probably excited about its new building because it will have room to display the autographed baseball. It got 15 million to buy the building. It is the exact building where Negro Leagues began. The vacant building was once a YMCA. So let's go back and make sure there's not any more information that we need about this new museum and specifically about the museum workers. Okay. 
If we go back to the beginning of the article, it says, when the baseball that Leroy Satchel Page and Josh Gibson autographed went up for sale several years ago, the staff at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum wanted to get their mitts on it. And why wouldn't they? On the ball were the signatures of two of the greatest players in Negro Leagues history, in all of baseball history for that matter. But the small museum devoted to telling the story of the Negro Leagues struck out. The round relic fetched $30,000 more than the museum's yearly budget to buy such items. Now, though, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is about to hit a home run. Officials have unveiled an ambitious $15 million project to expand the organization's condition, I'm sorry, to expand the organization's collection and exhibition space. The museum plans to buy an old building up the street from the current museum and to turn it into a library and research center. The vacant building is an old YMCA where the first Negro League was born. The building served the black community of Kansas City, Missouri for decades. It was a place where people could go and get something to eat and not worry about segregation, Ray Doswell, the museum's curator, told Weekly Reader, Senior Edition. It's also where the Negro National League was founded. So it's a very good idea to reread the text from the beginning of the text, the end of the text, and, so, and not just to skim. Skimming is good, but as you can see there, when we skimmed, when we skimmed the first few paragraphs, we missed some of our text evidence we needed to make our correct answer choice. So looking at the inference question uh, again, the museum staff is probably excited about its new building because it will have room to display the autographed baseball. It got $15 million to buy the building. It is the exact building where Negro Leagues began. The vacant building was once a YMCA. So, our best answer choice using our text evidence is it got $15 million to buy the building because it didn't even have $30,000 to buy the autographed baseball. So now they have more money and are able to have a bigger building. We know um, it is amazing that it is the exact, exact building where the Negro Leagues began. That is amazing. But that is not what these paragraphs are talking about. So that we could slash that trash. The vacant building was once a YMCA. That's not necessarily why they're super excited about it. A, it will have room to display the autographed baseball. Um, the issue was not so much that it didn't have room, but they couldn't afford the baseball. So the best answer choice is B. It got $15 million to buy the building. So then when we go to number two, examples of figurative language in this passage include all of the following, except black players finally got their shot in the majors. Nurse it. The vacant building is an old YMCA. The small museum struck out. So figurative language is a way of saying things without saying them literally. It is figurative. So when something is um, hinting at something else, or for example, hyperbole is extreme exaggeration, um, then you are able to say it's figurative language. So we can knock out and X out the answers that are not figurative language that are literal. Examples of figurative language in this passage include all of the following except, and these are all from the passage, Black players finally got their shot in the majors. That's not figurative language, that is literal. So we can cross that out. B, nurse it. So we're gonna have to go back to that and see what, what that's about. Does it literally mean to nurse it in that sentence? The vacant building is an old YMCA. That's factual and it's not, um, it's literal and it is not figurative. So we can cross out A and C. And D, the small museum struck out. So, Examples of figurative language in the passage include all the following except, and actually if we go back to A, black players finally got their shot in the majors. They didn't get an actual shot, so that one can be crossed out. So it's not A, okay? That is one that is not figurative language. Nurse it is not literally nursing it, but making it grow. That is figurative language, so B is correct. Uh, no, sorry, B is a, figurative, a piece of figurative language. C, the vacant building is an old YMCA. C, the vacant building is an old YMCA. Okay, that is literal language and uh, not figurative. And D, the small museum struck out. Struck out is figurative language. It didn't literally strike out. The reason, um, so it didn't literally strike out. So then, our best answer choice that does not include figurative language, I'm sorry, our best answer choice, I apologize for that, our best answer choice, which um, does not include figurative language, is C, the vacant building is an old YMCA. 
So A, black players finally got their shot in the majors. Um, getting some, your shot is figurative language. It's an expression. It's an idiom. We'll talk about that more at another time. Nurse it doesn't mean to litter. Excuse me. doesn't mean to literally nurse it. It means to make it grow. The vacant building is an old YMCA is simply a fact and literal. The museum struck out. That is an idiom. The museum did not actually strike out. It is figurative. So our, our answer choice that does not include figurative language is C. Number three. The reason African Americans were not allowed to play with white players was. So you're going to need to read through the question and the answer choices and pick the best answer. In order to do that, you're going to have to go back and reread the text and find the correct and um, find the correct text evidence, which helps you choose the answer. You need at least one piece of text evidence plus using your prior knowledge or background knowledge to make your inference or educated guess about what the author is trying to say. So I need you to answer number three, number four, number five, number three, four, and five. So please pause the video as you work on reading the question, reading the answer choices, go back and reread the article in order to determine which is the correct answer choice. You are looking for text evidence which supports the correct answer choice, supports the inference you are going to make. Pause the video to do that now, please. Hopefully you were able to pause the video and complete questions three, four, and five. So question three, the reason African-Americans were not allowed to play with white players was, A, they weren't as athletic as white players, B, that there were too few hotels they could stay in, C, that they were old, D, due to the practice of segregation. Hopefully after rereading and looking for text evidence, you determined that the correct answer was D, due to the practice of segregation. Number four, after baseball became integrated, which of the following records were made? A, Satchel Paige was probably the oldest major league rookie. B, Cool Papa Bell stole 173 bases. C, Henry Aaron broke Babe Ruth's home run, home run record. Or D, all of the above. So in order to determine that, again, you need to go back to the passage to figure out the answer, to look for text evidence. So after, after Jackie Robinson integrated baseball, what were some records which were broken? So let's go back and look at where Jackie Robinson integrated baseball. In 1947, black players finally got their shot in the majors. That's when Jackie Robinson, a veteran of the Negro Leagues, integrated baseball while playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And under the section, great ball players. Many Negro League players became baseball's best. Henry Aaron, who played for several major league teams, including the Atlanta Braves, began his career slugging home runs for the Indianapolis Clowns of the Negro American League. In 1974, he broke Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. James Cool Papa Bell was one of the fastest men in baseball. During his career, he saw 173 bases. Paige used to say Bell was so quick that he could flip off a light switch in the bedroom and be across the room under the covers before the light went out. Then there was Paige himself. After two decades in the Negro Leagues, Page helped the Cleveland Indians win the American League pennant in 1948. At the time, Page was a 42-year-old major league rookie pitcher, meaning he was new to pitching in the major leagues, but not with his um, segregated baseball team. So the uh, African-American players contributed quite a bit to breaking all those records. So let's go back to the question. You should have been able to determine that um, you should have been able to determine the answer to that question. After baseball became integrated, which of the following records were made? A, Satchel Paige was probably the oldest major league rookie. B, Cool Papa Bell stole 173 bases. C, Henry Aaron broke Babe Ruth's home run record. So the one that, uh, the one that was not necessarily correct was A. Satchel Paige was probably the oldest major league rookie. That is the correct answer. Cool Papa Bell sold 173 bases is a record that was broken. Henry Aaron broke Babe, Babe Ruth's home run record is a record that was broken, but Satchel Paige was probably the oldest major league rookie. It's possibly true, but it does not say that. Um, that is we don't know that that record was broken. So our best answer choice after slashing our trash 
um, and the answers that are not correct is A. Satchel Paige is probably the oldest major league rookie. Number five, why would it be difficult to play baseball if after working in the iron mills, why would it be difficult to play baseball if after working in the iron mills or on the railroads until game time? So you would have to write this out in a complete sentence. It would be difficult to play baseball after working in the iron mills or on the railroads until game time because in order to get that answer, again, you need to go back to the text and look for your text evidence. So let's go back and reread to find our answer. So as we're reading back through this, we can find a little bit more information. So as we're looking, it says, why did African-Americans in under the section first Negro League, why did African-Americans need a league of their own? They had to form their own leagues because they weren't allowed to play with white ball players. The first Negro League got its start in 1920. That's when Andrew Root Foster, a pitcher in, with the 1902 Cuban X Giants and the Chicago Union Giants, decided that black players needed a baseball league. Foster met with a group of African-Americans at the YMCA in Kansas City. There they formed the Negro National League. The league flourished, which means it succeeded for a decade. It is your league, Foster told fellow African-Americans. African Nurse it, help it, keep it. African-Americans soon began playing in other Negro leagues around the country. Traveling from town to town was a hard life for many. Because hotels in many cities did not allow blacks inside, the players slept on buses and stadiums and along the sides of roads. More often than not, players had to face ethnic slurs and taunts. Out on the field, there'd be some white folks in the stands, Satchel Page wrote in his autobiography. Some of them would call you hateful names, but most would cheer you. In 1947, black players finally got their shot in the majors. That's when Jackie Robinson, a veteran of the Negro Leagues, integrated baseball by playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So we know that conditions were hard for um, African-American players, even on the Negro League, because of segregation. So when you think about the question, why would it be difficult to play baseball if after working in the iron mill, if after working in the iron mills or on railroads until game time? If you think about the question and you think about um, having to physically work hard, hopefully you are able to come up with the answer um, based on your background knowledge or prior knowledge, plus our clues from the text um, and just critical thinking skills in general that you would be extremely physically tired once uh, you needed to go home from work after working in iron mills, which are labor intensive or on railroads, and you would not be at your best when playing the game. So that is the nonfiction article a museum of their own. And we have answered our inference questions on that. Um, we have something for you to practice tonight. Um, I would like you to look at the time flies short fiction short story and if you can underline the title and make a prediction about what you think the um, short story is going to be about you can print that out to do this or you can try to do it on the um, google doc you can also um or google form or, and google doc sorry um you can number the paragraphs so that you can determine where you found your text evidence. And as you read this, I want you to think about what you're reading and write down annotations or notes or questions that you have as you're reading. You do have questions which go along with this that have to do with making inferences. There are five questions. This is your practice for this evening. Um, the link to this should have been provided to you and you should be able to practice um, making inferences using both text evidence, uh, which are using text evidence, which are your clues from the text, plus your prior knowledge, what you already know about the subject or topic. Thank you very much and have a great day.